Hi, just testing. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Uh, so uh, my talk today is called So You Move Graphics Driver to the Kernel, which is sort of old news. So what now? What does that give us? And where's my ponies that I keep, I keep hearing about? Everyone keeps asking for ponies. Uh, my name is David Early. I, I work for Red Hat in Brisbane, in Australia, um, on the XORG team. I mainly work on Fedora and upstream kernel drivers, uh, along with supporting X and random other miscellaneous pieces of stuff like Mesa and things. Um, just apologies, I'm only here for a day, flying in and flying out, and I'm not feeling too good. So if I sort of ramble off into the woods or anything, just bear with me. <laughs> so uh, first of all, really, the question is, well, why KMS? <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> Problem with, the problem with what we had before was basically it was wrong. It was, it was like having a pony as your mechanic. It, you, were, you had a bunch of drivers which weren't in the kernel, which were sitting up in X windows, which is mainly a rendering system. So it was like a, we've got a rendering system and we just bolted on a whole lot of low-level graphics hardware into it. And yeah, it seemed like a good idea. Maybe, no, it never seemed like a good idea. But <laughs> somebody, somebody got it far enough back in the early 90s, possibly, well, X380, when X386 did. Well, we've got all the, at the time, there was an awful lot of X86 Unix variants, which you never hear of. And they wanted to have one version of X. They didn't want to have to do drivers for each Unix variant. And this was a laudable goal, but, sorry, couldn't, oh yes, also some of these systems suffered from the problem of not actually being able to do kernel drivers for graphics hardware. So, yes. Was a great idea back then, not, but it, it sustained. And really, for the last seven, eight years, we've been trying to figure out some way out of this hole. But um, we finally managed to get a, a system. Once when Keith Packard from Intel got his uh, Runner 1.2 idea and got that working, and then we sort of p p used that as the interface basis for a whole kernel interface, which allows you to have multiple monitors and like that was our other problem was in the kernel we had the frame buffer device interface which totally didn't handle multi-head so our options were either to come up with something new and bolt it onto our 3D rendering system or a kernel support for that or try and change FBDev changing FBDev just didn't seem like a good idea so about geez, three years ago I think it was we started KMS and myself and Jesse Barnes at Intel pretty much wrote the first initial hack of it in a few weeks, and we've sort of been steadily upstreaming it and adding stuff to it since then. So the main thing it gives you is the drivers are in the kernel, along with every other driver for every other piece of hardware in your system. It's like, oh, it suddenly makes sense. Um, writing a KMS driver is a bit more, there's a few more requirements on it. So it's the main requirement of having a KMS driver, and one of the other reasons we never really got to do this before was you needed some sort of memory management system to deal with the video RAM memory and the GTT memory, which is like AGP was the first thing that really brought this concept out, where you had a piece of memory that was linear from the uh, CPU, at linear from the GPU, but made up of pages that were scatter gather on the CPU side. So, uh, but, so you've got these two memory regions that are fixed size, but you can dynamically, um, one of them is fixed RAM on video RAM cards, and you can dynamically move pages in and out of the other one. This is, was well, originally, we all thought this was a really, really hard problem. <laughs> and, and lots of people sort of went, yeah, we'll get to that. We'll just keep going, and we'll get to that next year, and we'll get to it, and we'll get to it. And then nobody got to it for a few years. And finally, um, Tungsten Graphics, the, they're now part of VMware. They finally got to it. Um, but Unfortunately, they didn't really do, do much API design when they did their first implementation. What happened was one guy started up in Mesa and worked his way down, and one guy started at the bottom of the kernel and worked his way up, and then they met in the middle and went, and uh, hey, API. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't really an API. It was, it, it tried, first of all, it tried to be a generic memory management API for graphics cards, which 
when you first initially look at this product problem, and you go, oh, well, graphics cards pretty much all the same. They've got video RAM or maybe no video RAM. Like in Intel case, we've got a GTT the translation table area for dynamic paging stuff. But the problem is when you actually go beyond that and actually look at how you want to use certain areas of those RAMs for different things, the interface just expanded and expanded. So they had a generic API with a whole lot of driver-specific flags going into it. So it was actually not that generic. And people are like, well, how come I can't just create a buffer and put stuff on screen without having to pass different flags for different cards? You're going, yeah, actually, looking back, probably not a good idea. Generic is not going to really work. There's certain bits that are generic, but in terms of creating objects that work on the graphics card, the generic wasn't enough. The interface just got so ugly, and trying to maintain it was going to be a big problem. So um, after we fought on this for a while, I, I actually implemented the first kernel mode setting system on top of that system and on Intel hardware with Jesse. And then in, Keith and Eric, two guys who work for Intel, suddenly went, yeah, let's actually make a proper memory manager. So we left our mode setting stuff aside for a while. I think we shipped that version of mode setting in Fedora 9 or 10, which if anyone used that was a horrible nightmare. Sorry, but uh, yeah, progress. But yeah, Keith worked on Gem. And Gem was a much simpler API. It was only adapted to Intel's well, the initial API was mainly sort of set around Intel's non-video RAM cards, and you only had one memory space to deal with. I had the concept of cache domains, which were, you, know, you had, if you, graphics cards have lots of caches in them, so if you're doing something like pulling from a texture, it'll cache some of the texture. If you're rendering to a buffer, it'll, it'll stick it in a cache before it puts it into the video RAM. So you had to, it was mainly about managing those caches. Um, when I came along then to do ATI support, I had VRAM. So I suddenly had this, well, I've got this memory manager from Tungsten that works, but it has a really ugly API. And I've got this API from Keat that works, but can't handle my other case. So what we did was we took Keat's gem API and took the TTM back, the internals, which weren't actually that bad. <laughs> they were workable compared to the API. At least you could change them later. The problem is with, if you stick a kernel API in the kernel, you're stuck with it forever. And that was like, let's not, let's not get stuck with an API that we can't, you know. The main thing was it exposed way too many details of the internals. So if you change something internally, the API would suddenly have to change. And that just wasn't going to work. So we bolted Keith's gem API onto the Radeon one and, and used the TTM internals. And at the same time, VMware rewrote the whole of the memory manager in the kernel. So it sort of has worked out now. At two, we, have, we have two memory managers. We've got the gem Intel-based one. And then Nouveau and Radeon are sharing uh, the TTM backend, along with, I think, VMware. Um, and as new cards come on, we'll see what way they, they're going to pick it up. Some of them may use one, some may use the other, some may use their own. Some cards, like simple, you know, Cirrus card, like the emulated cards, probably don't really need much of a memory manager. You, you know, just give it a block. You want all of the video RAM, because that's all you can get. It's got four megs of video RAM. You probably don't need to do much work. But yeah, the driver requirements. So the big thing, the KMS part of the kernel driver is not that difficult. It's pretty much taking the code that's in the XORG driver, pulling it into the kernel infrastructure, moving and moving the interfaces to the right places. It's designed around the, the concept, the kernel mode setting of having CRTCs, which are the piece of the graphics card that do the scanning out. So they read from the video RAM and get send stuff to encoders. And then the encoders are wired up to connectors. And they're basically the three basic objects that we have, CRTC, encoder, connector. And it mostly works. There are certain cards we're having some small corner case issues, but we managed to mangle most things into using those three as the concepts. Um, but So that stuff's pretty much similar to what you end up doing in X. The memory manager is actually the hard part. Getting all that stuff working is actually quite, you know, still a bit of code. Even using the generic back end, you still have to write a fair bit of interface code. But, so that's probably the bigger step that people have to take when they're trying to do a KMS implementation. So it's taken us two or three years, so there has to be some reason we bothered, because <laughs> it was a big job. And looking back, you know, it's one of those, God, if I'd known this was going to take this long, I think I'd have not bothered. But <laughs> so one of the first big things we can do with KMS that we really couldn't do with the old XORG infrastructure, well, one thing that I like, is we can actually do proper power saving systems. So for example, laptops. We can actually implement the power saving features that the hardware has. Whereas with the old XORG drivers, if you have a problem, 
So XOR, the way 3D rendering and stuff worked before, well, even works now, is you had X would talk to a kernel, a piece of driver in the kernel, and then the 3D client would talk to a piece of a driver in the kernel. But X would set the graphics card up and then initialize the kernel driver. So if you couldn't do stuff in the kernel until X was running. So power saving was quite hard, because if X wasn't running, you couldn't actually have anything to drive the power saving hardware. The other problem was, if X is running and you have a 3D application running, X has no real idea that the 3D application is doing anything. So if X was in charge of deciding when to do power saving, it wouldn't have a clue that the 3D application was running or doing anything important or drawing up, you know, playing games. So you just simply, the architecture just couldn't cope with the, what we needed to do. So since we've put KMS through, Intel have done a lot of different power saving features on different pieces of hardware, some successful, some not so, but mainly starting to get to the point where we're hitting the problems in the hardware instead of the software architecture being the problem, which is always good. So, you know, so we can now, in theory, from a graphics card point of view, at least be as good as Windows on, on the hardware, where we could never do that before. On Radeon, we haven't quite gotten yet, but we are, for 2634, we have PowerPlay, which is the ATI power management marketing name, but we have all the patches to, to do PowerPlay except it's a bit glitchy. Sometimes you get, you know, it jumps into a power, low power mode and it glitches the screen, but they're, they're working on trying to nail the last couple of bugs in that. Um, and I'll get to them later, actually, what the current state of a lot of drivers, so, and NVIDIA is doing a bit of that as well. Another feature that's pretty cool, and hopefully this works, because these things never work for me, is KDB. So this is a video, which if you saw, it was running X-Windows. It's jumped into the kernel debugger, and now it's jumped back to X-Windows. So uh, you'll see it, and you can still run. Here's a hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to demo this, but I didn't get the time to actually build it on, the, on this laptop. But uh, basically, if anyone's ever used the kernel debuggers, it, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to debug on the machine you're on. And with KMS, you can actually jump you know, while X is still running. Well, X isn't running, but you can trap the machine and go into the debugger and take over the graphical display, do stuff and then get back into X. So you don't have to kill X to use the debugger on the same terminal. So I, this was something I think, I think Novell tried to do about five or six years ago and had a lot of trouble getting working. I think the kernel, Novell kernel debugger had a lot of problems trying to trap in and out of text modes and making it work. So KMS really enables this. That, that demo is working. The KMS part of it's not so bad. We're actually going to get that upstream quite soon. The keyboard side of it's quite ugly, apparently, because if you've got a USB keyboard and you, in, you can't use interrupts, it gets really messy, apparently. So, But it, they're two of the bigger things. Uh, I've, I've got a couple of other... In, it, it also enables a lot of enhancements in user space that we didn't have. Mainly, the memory management side actually en enables a lot of things that we couldn't have done before that... We'd wanted to, you know, like, we, if you looked at a lot of the OpenGL drivers stuck on way old versions because we needed the memory management. Uh, so people have heard about this thing, I'm sure. Or, or there's a, a new architecture called Gallium 3D. Uh, it, it, it's pretty much, people claim it's a pony. Uh, and I, I don't even think it's the people who designed it that claim it's a pony, but you see it being claimed in a lot of forums and sites. Oh, this is going to be the future. It's, it's great. And it is, but it's not what everyone thinks it is. It, it's simply an architecture for designing graphics drivers in user space, you know, for doing the acceleration portion of graphics drivers, which will always remain in user space. So you can design one Gallium 3D core driver, and then you can bolt on a piece that makes it into an OpenGL driver. You can bolt on a piece that makes it into a, an XORG driver to do you know, X render support. And you can bolt on a piece that will make it do OpenVG, in theory, DirectX. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really a rework of what we had before with Mesa to make a generic portion in the middle and then load the bolt on bits that would allow us to expand. No, not direct draw. It's mainly designed around the needs of modern 3D hardware, which direct draw is probably a bit older. <laughs> so, uh, but it just, to, just when you see all the, you know, if you read articles about it, right, if you're sending it, it's like, oh, yeah, little Gallium, you know, why aren't, why aren't drivers all doing this? Why isn't it out there yet? It's a long-term project. VM, Tungsten Graphics started it. 
VMware bought them. Um, now they're putting more effort into it. The big things, other things that will work with OpenCL, I don't know if you've heard, that's another plugin that should work at some stage. But um, it's taking, it's going to take a while. I think there's only one driver really using it. There's maybe two now. And Nouveau used, used it because they could use whatever, you know, they had no legacy to work on. So they were quite happy just to go with the new stuff. And uh, VMware have used it for their internal driver. And that's now open source as well. Both their Xorg driver and their 3D driver are using Gallium 3D architecture. So it's, it, it's a cool thing coming in the future. I think the, it, it's got a better, slightly better abstraction layer for adding new interfaces to than trying to plunk them on GL. But there's still people that are debating whether we could just plunk things on top of GL and still get the same performance without having to deal, deal with this. The big problem with it, of course, is if you're someone like you've got a driver already, you've got it all implemented, you've got most of your features in it, to move to Gallium 3D is a whole new start again, pretty much. You, you can't just, so it, in terms of I'm shipping something and it's working, and then I change over to the Gallium driver, it's just going to be regression hell. So that's probably one of the bigger problems with it is how do we get the, that, the, the Gallium driver and the current driver on a par so that we can sort of drop the current driver and keep the Gallium one going. That's, going forward, that'll be one of the bigger challenges I expect. I, you know, different, different people in the community have different ideas on how it's going to work. But it, it, it's interesting. The Radeon driver, we finally got people. It, one thing I've noticed with Gallium, though, more people seem to have appeared out of the woodwork to work on drivers. Like, more people are showing up on IRC going, how do I do stuff? Or I've added this to Gallium. I've done something with it. So I don't want to, maybe just because of some of the buzz or maybe because it had a niftier name or something, it seems to have picked up some community involvement, which is quite, if you look at the Mesa list recently, there's been a lot of people just appearing <laughs> with patches to do magic. Like some guys ported, I don't know, a thing called EGL, which is like an embedded GL for use on mobile devices. And Mesa didn't really have a good EGL stack or anything. And then some guy from Android has appeared to, with like a re oh, loads of code to do OpenGL ES, the embedded subset. and all this with the Gallium architecture. So there's a lot of people working on it, and it's a bit of a, there is a bit of a buzz around it. It's just not the answer to everyone's prayers that a lot of people thought it might be. Another area that we had is uh, that we enabled using the kernel memory set mode setting was DRI2. Basically, the old DRI architecture was, yeah, it, it sort of worked. But when it came to things like compositing, it totally failed. So you know, if, you, if you had your laptop, and you're running compis, and you ran gears, and you wobbled the gears window, the gears stayed there, and the window went like, and it was ugly. <laughs> so DRI2 was an attempt to make compositing work properly. The initial DRI2 had some shortcomings. Uh, we still pushed it out a bit, bit too early, I expect. We've added back front buffer rendering, which was neat. And there's a whole lot of syn synchronization extensions. So if you're doing OpenGL and you want, oh, I want to draw on the V blank, you know, when, in, in line with the screen, or I want to draw in five V blanks. OpenGL has all these extensions to do that. And we had them all at the DRI 1. And we're only getting them back now with DRI 2. So it, it's catching up with what we had, but it also enables the cool desktop, the composited desktop that everyone wants to see. So it, there is more work going on DR, DRI 2. I think, yeah, it's got other issues. I think like, certain games go really slow. And the biggest question you get with DRI 2 is why is my GLX gears way slower than it used to be? And, you know, no matter how many times you tell people GLX Gears is not a benchmark, never quite get through. There's even a, I think there's even a website somebody pointed out this morning. Is, is GLX Gears a benchmark.com? <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that people have been on and talking about is a, a new display server. So I, I don't know. I think the I just the small dog on top of large pony. So it's like yeah, instead of X Windows, which is like big, the idea was to have something that just used all the cool features of the kernel and used all these things, but didn't be X. Yeah, you know, didn't need to be as much as much overhead or not just as large or as have much legacy as X. So a project has been started called Wayland. I'm sure people may have heard of it if they're following any of this stuff. Wayland is like a very simple display server, which allows you to run composited applications on the desktop. You can run a GTK, I think, on Qt, or maybe GTK only, and Qt could run natively, apps natively inside Wayland. Uh, you can run 
GL apps inside Wayland. You can run an X server inside Wayland so that you can actually run your X apps. And one of the other cool things is you can run two X servers inside Wayland. So you can do the spinning cube, but user switching, which is like the Apple feature. Like, so if you've seen, you, know, you can switch users at the moment, but it's ugly because it, it goes from one X server to another X server and changes VT. With Wayland, in theory, you can integrate two different users onto the same graphics device, and it will look a lot cleaner. But Wayland suffers from other issues, which is it's not X, which means you need to move a lot of apps if you wanted to use it for anything other than running X servers. Um, the Wayland developer is mainly a graphics driver guy, and um, he hasn't really gotten the whole concept of how we're going to ever get input into Wayland. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem with X is X has got like equally large pieces of input service support. Like that's fairly, you know, a lot of it. Peter down the back will talk about it if, <laughs> if you want to bend his ear. But it's, you know, there's quite a substantial. A lot of people think of X. They're all thinking of X orgs rendering and XOR graphics providers, but the input portion is quite a big piece. So to have something like Wayland as your native interface for people that without an X server running requires a lot more than just getting it to draw. It requires you being able to interact, and that's where currently it falls down. Even just this morning, I was just chatting with someone and saying, well, maybe we could something like, we could sort of use Wayland as the basis for the legendary X12, which is like, you know, the new X11, you know, because we could drop a lot of the old protocol and build it on top of something simpler. But yeah, in terms of whether it's actually going to, you're going to see this in a distribution in the next year, not sure. You might see it in embedded scenarios. I think some of the embedded people are sort of, especially if you're running just like a GL desktop or you've only got a very limited set of apps and you don't need to have legacy X window support, it may get picked up for stuff like that. It may not. So question is, well, we've got a few drivers, so hopefully this one clicks. What's the status of the, the drivers? It took a while to find the penguin, penguins and ponies in the same picture. <laughs> so at the moment, there's uh, three main graphics manufacturers that anyone cares about, and then there's the others. <laughs> And I'm sure they care about themselves, but nobody else does. Um, so uh, I'll start at the top. These are the, the, the pony attachments. These ones are more of a weird stuff I found on the internet than anything useful. But I always always remember when you're searching the internet, safe search should be on. <laughs> Even the word ponies with safe search off is dangerous. <laughs> so um, Intel's driver. Well, Intel was the leader since it was the first one we ran, we did KMS work on because they were the first people to give us open source code and documentation. Um, we have KMS support from everything from the i830 right up to whatever we don't have. You know, it's, it's usually the GMA 4500 and beyond, i3, i5, whatever comes out next week, next year. No, except for Pulsebo, but it's on the others. I, I, I can't blame Intel too much for Pulsebo because it's a big company. <laughs> and parts of it make decisions without the rest of it. <laughs> but um, the Intel driver, yeah, we've got full KMS from pretty much every shipping useful part, except the one we shall not name. And um, it's memory management support. Actually, in, in, as far as I'm aware, I would nearly consider the Intel kernel driver not finished, but close to feature complete, I'd say. It's, we, the, the, most of the power management stuff that's been coming in lately, it's either worked or been horrible because the, the hardware hasn't supported it. But I can't see there's been much more requirement on adding to enable more of the 3D stuff or to enable more of the 2D. It, I think it'll all, all be in user space to make things better. There may be one or two things that need to be added, but I think it's fairly feature complete. And it's sort of, I won't say it's mature yet, but maybe in another kernel release, it'll be to the level where it's stable and mature. That would be nice. Keith can do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, so it's in a good place. Uh, Intel have dropped support for user mode setting from their XORG driver. So, when, from their XOR, from their 2.10 release, there's no more support for non-KMS machines. So, if someone was using a non-KMS environment, you have to use the Intel 2.9 driver forever. 
There's going to be no more support. The code's all gone. It was great. It was a great milestone to get rid of all of that code because it makes the XORG driver into something that really doesn't change that much anymore. It's a nice small thing that we don't have to worry about. Yeah, I don't know where this one either. <laughs> so, AMD and ATI. Where are with this was the, this is pretty much the second KMS driver that we did. Um, we have support for everything from the R100, which is like the you know, eight-year-old chip, to um, R700. R800, the new card with all the six heads and cool monitor support, hasn't been done yet, but I think it will be out in the next two weeks, I think he said he has the code. He has the, already got the code written, so it's just a matter of pushing it out and sending me the hardware, because I want six monitors. But <laughs> <laughs> it does look nice, those six monitors. I'd have to get a bigger desk, I suspect. But um, so in terms of support, what, what it gives you on, on ATI, we ha it's in staging at the moment um, in the kernel to turn it on by default. So the code's all built, even if you build a Radeon driver, but it only turns on by default if you use the staging option. And um, we're shipping it in Fedora 12 is pretty much the latest code, and 13, and it will most likely be the main driver for AMD ATI stuff in the operating enterprise operating system that I shall not name. I shall not version. You can name, but not version. Um, so it's it's been a good in a good state. It it pretty much supports everything, all those cards at nearly as well as the old stuff. And we've enabled a lot of people to do things like suspend resume on laptops that would never have done it before. So we, we found it's, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier for us to debug stuff like that, suspend and resume and things like that, because the old suspend resume system involved running the BIOS again. And that was, well, you, you pretty much was a you know, crapshoot. You didn't know whether the BIOS was going to ever work or what it was going to do. Because in theory, well, it brought the machine up in the first place. It should be able to do it again. Not so much in practice. So. Uh, it, it's been it's good like that. You can actually the BIOS has scripts in it that you run at boot up or at resume. So we we can now run those scripts inside the kernel and debug what's going on. Uh, one of the bigger t things about the I know, people who would have followed if they're following ATI development, you had this Radeon versus Radeon HD. There's two drivers. What the hell's happening? Why have we got two drivers? Um, the primary point of disagreement over Radeon versus Radeon HD was the use of ATI's BIOS table system. So they've got a set of, my, like, sort of like scripts, but yeah, calling them scripts will annoy the person in Radeon HD, so I should just keep calling them that. But they're like bytecode tables. And they, we have a little interpreter that runs the bytecode tables to do things like initialize the card, turn on outputs, turn on clocks, change memory clocks. And pretty much it means you don't have to know about every little detail of every card. And with ATI, that's a really good advantage because they have an awful lot of cards and they all have little problems. <laughs> so the fact that you can just have the BIOS take it, the scripts take care of most of that for you is great. You can still find out about them. You can just read the, what, the, what registers the tables are hitting, and they're mostly the same. That's just one card you know, will have this random change, and they'll be like, needed this for something. So um, that was the primary disagreement between Radeon and Radeon HD. Was Radeon HD wanted to do all of that stuff natively, even if it took forever, whereas Radeon, I actually wanted to ship. So I actually wanted to give it to users as opposed to play with it. So um, when we moved all this stuff into the kernel, it's all been done with the scripts. So Radeon HD no longer has, with, with all mode setting in the kernel, there's no reason for it to disagree with Radeon because it's not using the mode setting code in, in itself. So in, in fact, the only bit of code that's left in it if you remove the mode setting code is the code that's from Radeon. So it's like, well, why would we need this driver anymore? It's the exact same code. So it's like, hopefully they will get that message soon. And give up. <laughs> There's been probably, because it, it's written by a couple of people in Novell, and their kernel guys and their ex guys are like, well, which way do we go? So it's, I'm sure it will resolve itself in the next while. But um, yeah, the big thing that's missing from AMD ATI support at the moment is power saving, as I've said earlier. We've got patches, hopefully for 2634. Where it really hits is if you've got, one of the, if you've got an R600 laptop, you might find it heats up a bit. There's some of those dual CPU, GPU laptops as well. You switch on the ATI one, and you're, you'll heat your desk and probably your legs. <laughs> so it's, yeah, through the desk. <laughs> it can get quite hot. But the, and even I've got some of the desktop cards. Like I've got one desktop card from AMD that takes two PCI Express power cables to run. 
and you need full like 750 watt power supply to plug it in. And yeah, that thing's loud and hot. Literally, if I turn it on, even like it either runs fully with the fan or no fan, and it just gets so hot you can't touch it. So it's hopefully we'll get the power saving stuff sorted pretty soon. It mainly have to we have to hook it up so we can read back the temperature sensors and stuff like that. But that should all be pretty easy to do once we get going. In terms of uh, user, space support, user space support, we have an unstable API still, but I'm hoping next week I will get time to make it stable. I will, I'm thinking of moving it out of staging in the kernel before 2.6.33 goes out, just to say the, la the last patch here, it's out of staging. From now on, we'll, we'll abide by the real rules and um, making the user space API stable at the same time and releasing, it, releasing a new version of the user space driver so, di so distros can pick it up. I'm confident enough now that the, it's ready for distros that aren't Fedora, because with Fedora, I'm the, only, I'm the only one dealing with it, so it's not so bad. But for other distros, what happens is they, they ship it, and then I get their bugs. I'm like, I don't want your bugs. <laughs> I've got my own distro to work on. So it's, I'm hoping now that it's good enough. It's a harder problem than for Intel, because there is so many ATI cards, and there's so many variations of each ATI card, it's, oh, it's in the thousands of thousands when you go down to how many you have to go through. It's not just PCI IDs. I wish it was. Um, Nouveau. <laughs> <Fuck it. laughs> yes, they're the, the Trojan horse driver. <laughs> um, Nouveau was actually, uh, you know, it's considering its roots and how much it's, we hired Ben into Red Hat in Brisbane, so he works in the same office as I do, and uh, he's been tireless. Like I've been trying to persuade him, yeah, take time off. <laughs> you're, you're not you're not working in your spare time anymore. You can work all day on this. <laughs> but uh, it has gone from it, it started off as a, as a user mode setting driver, and he pretty much brought the kernel mode setting code up to the same level. And last week, deleted all the user mode setting code. So he's quite happy that kernel mode setting is way better for Nouveau. And Nouveau is great like that because they don't have that legacy worry because it barely worked before. So <laughs> working better is, you know, it's always going to be better than what they had because it's, it's still ramping up. But they've got KMS support, I think, pretty much on everything from NV4 up to the latest G80. I think the only thing they don't have is some of the ion chips. I think they have the mode setting support, but not the acceleration support on the, some of the ions. But I think that's just a matter of me buying an ion and giving it to Ben and saying, go away and come back when it's working. Um, Nouveau recently had controversy when, it, when Linus, somebody gave Linus an NVIDIA card, Intel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so first rule of hardware, don't give it to Linus. <laughs> because... He gives out when he's got no drivers. It's like, <laughs> so he realized he was running Fedora. His graphics card worked. He booted his own kernel. His graphic card stopped working. He went, this isn't right. So he gave out a lot, <laughs> quite a lot. So we eventually you know, worked or figured it out. But the main reason we, that the upstreaming hadn't happened was because there was contact. These programs, pieces of Sort of like microcode as well. There were context switching. So if you had a, two applications running, you've got one 3D app and another 3D app, and the graphics card has to jump between them. To know when it, when it gets scheduled to jump, it causes an interrupt, and that call, it calls a little little um, controller on the hardware to swap all the registers. So pretty much all it does is reads a bunch of registers, stores them into RAM, reads a bit of RAM, and stores it back into the registers. So they have these programs for every NVIDIA card from NV40 up. And um, he... Pretty much, we, the way they reverse engineered in Nouveau is they just trace you know, the, what the binary driver was writing to the hardware, and they saw the binary driver writing this big lump of you know, binary code that looked like some sort of firmware, and they took that and stuck it in the driver and made it work. But uh, we never had a, cr a really good legal clearance on that code. We actually shipped it in Fedora before we realized it was there. So then we went with, well, we've already shipped it. Nobody sued us. So we probably could get away with just keep pushing it out, but if someone else does it, we could get they could get in trouble. So it was it was, it was murky, and I, we just weren't sure what to do. But so we decided we just upstream it without that stuff. It made sense. The driver could work on some hardware, and if someone wanted to use it, they could pull these programs from somewhere else. 
But at the same time as we were upstreaming it, I told Ben, we had a discussion about it, and he said, I think I can get some of this working with my own stuff. He'd half reverse engineered it before. So he's gotten the NV40 class of cards firmware free. So he wrote it himself. He's written the generator for it. And it seems to mostly work. We've, we've pushed that upstream, and it seems to work. The NV50, which is the latest sort of set of cards, there's a couple of people, I think there's a company called, um, I don't see, someone, I think from here is talking about, is a free path scale. They're a compiler company, XSGI, and they've started looking into using Nouveau for doing some sort of GP, GPU stuff. On, and they're talking to NVIDIA, and one of their guys started realized, well, if they wanted to use Nouveau, they would, should try and help out and wanted to figure out. So one of their guys is actually working on the NV50 reverse engineering, and I think he has it down to like one instruction left that he has to figure out, so it's pretty close for him to write his own. So in terms of the legality thing, it's going away quite rapidly, and it's looking a lot better. In terms of hardware support, yeah, it seems fine. One thing, the other thing about NVIDIA, at least a lot of hardware is built fairly well. A lot of AMD's hardware, even with the source code and documentation, it's hard to get working, but a lot of NVIDIA seem to be a lot more validated. So when they do something, and granted, most of the things they're doing is copied from the binary driver because they have no other choice, so it gets it right most of the time. They also have a huge BIOS parser, script parser that was written, which does similar things. Not as complicated as the ATI one, but will do resume. So suspend resume works an awful lot better since they finished reverse engineering that. Um, but it, it, that's an impressive piece of code if, if anyone wants to be scared. Just look at the uh, Nouveau BIOS parser. It's an example of how reverse engineering code can get really ugly really quickly. <laughs> so what about the non-big tree? So who else have we? The other big area that seems to be a bit of a push on is virtualized graphic cards. So, well, since VMware bought Tungsten Graphics out and managed to get like 10 of the you know, main Mesa driver developer and kernel developers for 3D graphics cards, they have been pushing to get a proper 3D graphics stack inside the virtual machine. So they have released a Gallium driver now that has an, a kernel driver, XORG, and um, Mesa 3D driver. Uh, the kernel driver is in staging. Uh, it's pretty close to going into mainline, though. It's, it, wasn't, it wasn't in staging because of coding stall or anything. It was because they weren't confident that one of the pieces of the API was ready, but I think they finally fixed that. So we should have that pretty soon into non-staging. Um, VMware have also been working on the other side of the stack, because when they ran their, uh, op, you know, their application on top of the open source graphics drivers, and then ran like the DirectX 9 validation suite in Windows inside, the app, inside their VMware, they realized how bad the open source graphics drivers were because <laughs> there was just so much the GL conformance suite never, ever touched. So they're steadily trying to get some, at least working on the Intel one. I think we've seen bits of patches in other places. Uh, another virtual GPU that probably haven't been heard about much yet, but I'm only mentioning it because I work on it, but it's uh, I think called QXL. It's from, um, I know there's a project called Spice, which was um, just released by Red Hat about two or three weeks ago, or probably about a month ago now, which is uh, it's for Q, it's for QMU, but it's a spice it's sort of a it's from Quamernet, the guys that did KVM, and it's a it's, it's very fast. I'll say compared to something like um, uh, VNC or some of those, it's designed to be very good over the network to do. So we've got a virtual graphics device on the Spice project, which QXL, and we have an X Windows driver that's very basic, and I'm trying to work on doing a graphics driver for, for KMS. It's quite of a tricky card because there's no linear frame buffer because it's over there on the other machine, and it tries to avoid ever having to do reading back stuff, and it, it does it, something like FBCon is quite hard to do because the console sort of, you know, it likes to read itself, <laughs> so it's like, that's hard. Um, Cirrus, which is the default VMware, or sorry, the default QMU graphics card. That's uh, question marks. I did a driver on my laptop about a year ago, a year and a half ago, from old version of KMS, old version of TTM. Uh, recently, uh, a university in India, uh, along with a guy from Red Hat, have just started doing some sort of student project. So I think there's two or three students working on it. So they've, I've given them what I did before, and they're going to try and bring it up to scratch and make it work. So at least we could get... The main reason I'd like to have a good KMS implementation inside a virtual machine is because it makes it a lot easier to play with the KMS core without having to 
re-crashing your own, you know, if you're on a single laptop when you, which you're traveling and stuff, it's handy to be able to debug stuff. Um, UVESA KMS, it's sort of like, you know, UVESA FB, well, we like having a KMS implementation that would call out the user space to do VESA mode setting. For It would allow us to get rid of the X-Windows VESA driver, which Adam, and Adam Jackson in the corner there, my, my workmate, he'd be quite happy to do. So he's, he's, he's talked about UVESA KMS, but we may actually get around to implementing it. VIA, who knows, it's VIA. There's so many drivers and so many crazy people involved, it's, it's always hard to know what's going on. Uh, I'd like to see a VIA KMS driver. There's a VIA, they've recently done a VIA FB driver, so at least you've got some idea of the code. There are VIA memory management drivers sort of mostly done, so it's only a matter of trying to you know, get it all together and getting it upstream. The main thing that might help this out is the new old PC is VIA based, so hopefully, you know, they keep going, if we send you one, I'm going, no, 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 that doesn't work like that. <laughs> I have enough of them, you know, don't send me any more. So it's like, yeah, if, hopefully they'll get some time to do one. I think it leaves MGA, the Metrox is the only other card of old, of note, but the only place you see these any, anymore, outside of people who go, oh, I love my G400 because it had the best 2D ever, but what? Oh, yeah, I, I didn't mention them, but I should, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's the other one, PowerVR. SGX, Pulsebo, pretty much all the same. The, the big thing with SGX is SGX is a rendering core. It doesn't do mode setting. So you have to have a separate mode setting piece on the hardware. In terms of Pulsebo, it's actually pretty much the Intel mode setting piece. So they've just taken the Intel 915 mode setting chunk and pulled the graphics core out and put the 3D core on the side. So the code's nearly the exact same from mode setting point of view. From a memory management point of view, they have, there is open source kernel SGX code in the N900 kernel dump, but I haven't had time to figure out what it does, or because it's not actually being sent upstream, it's just in the patch. If you go through the patch, you'll see this SGX driver, but it's not using the DRM infrastructure properly. It's got its own driver. It's, it seems to be completely just a mishmash of things. So, yeah, it, Pulsebo is, it's a nightmare. It, SGX is another nightmare because it's been used in so many embedded devices now. It pretty much you can't get an embedded device that isn't possible. So, yeah, going forward, I have no idea what we're going to do. I think the mode setting point it will be per card, so it's different. So we'll have to figure that out. Yeah, I, I, I can't see a good solution until somebody either pays Imagination Technologies a lot of money <laughs> or buys them. <laughs> yeah, it, they don't they don't want to give that stuff out. So it's very hard to find. There may, be, there may be someone interested in reverse engineering it. It's just a matter of trying to persuade him that he really wants to because, you know, you have to get him the hardware. <laughs> so just the last bit. So what about non-Linux operating systems, just for anyone that cares, and binary drivers? So far, the only answer I have is... <laughs> 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 There is work going on, apparently, I've heard, on Open Solaris, inside and Sun. But when I ask, it's like, no, we can't show you the code. Right? It's my code. I wrote it. You're taking it. Not, and, yeah, but we, we have to make it all work perfectly before. We're, no, that's not how it works. Just shove it out there. We'll look at it and see what you did. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. So Sun may be doing something secretly in, in their DRI group, but nobody will know till it's out. They have a gem driver for Intel. They have going to get a KMS driver for Intel. They'll probably work on Radeon next. None other than that, BSD, maybe. One of the BSDs, I'm not sure which one, I think Free. I think he's got a sort of work, gem working. So he's got the memory manager for Intel working. KMS isn't that hard compared to getting the memory manager working. It doesn't need as much interact. The big part of KMS that's hard is interacting with the frame buffer console. And that's sort of per operating system anyway. So I think that's pretty much it. Oh, binary drivers, sorry. Binary drivers, yeah, I don't care. Uh. We can only do a couple of questions. So with putting memory management in the kernel, are we anywhere along a path where we could run X as not root? Oh, yeah, sorry, that was another feature I haven't really put in here because we've promised it and it hasn't. We, we're actually, it's not the graphics layer that's stopping us from running X's root now, so it can run. It actually will work now. I think Moblin ships with X not running as root, but 
there is a large security hole if you've got fast user switching. So um, yeah. the problem is the input. So if you've got fast user switching and your X servers are running as a user, I could just open your input device as my user. And when you switch to your user, I'll still have the input device open, and I can read your password. So the problem is we need revoke. Willie, where's my revoke? Yeah, so we, we're probably going to need revoke evdev, just like an evdev ioctl that revokes on the evdev device, or something that, that's the, the only thing that's really stopping it is the input layer. So it's. Um, there is something very, very scary happening in, uh, I think, a Windows world with laptops, which are those laptops with dual graphic chips, yeah. which seem to be hap able nowadays to dynamically switch at runtime. Uh, how, is there an interest in doing so? Is people thinking about it for us? Uh, and how do you, do you know how they do that? Do they expose just this minimum common set of features in GL of the two chips, or? No, no, they, well, I as far as the Ajax knows more about it. Cool, so Ajax knows more about that, but yeah, at the moment we probably could get to the stage of log out of X, log back in. Before KMS we couldn't do anything. With KMS we could probably get to that stage, but we need a lot of work on X to get the next stage, which is dynamic. Which Ajax talks about. Um, there. Uh, this will have to even. Ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, that looks like one of your power saving patches. Oh, 830M. <laughs> Buy a new laptop. <laughs> if you enable uh, the KMS drivers built in in the, in the Fedora kernel, will that solve the binary driver problem for you? Which. Well, we actually do build all the KMS drivers in Fedora. They're, they're built into the kernel? Oh, if we build them into the kernel. Yeah. I, don't, I think we could do that, but we have, other, we have other reasons we don't want to do that. But at the moment, because uh, but we, we have thought about it, but the main reason was firmware. We'd have to build all the firmwares in, and it just got messy. But from Fedora, we don't care, but we don't really want to break them too much because there's other places people use them that we have to sort of care about. <laughs> um. Thanks a lot, Dave. Let's, oh, we have Thanks. time for this wine for you. Oh. oh thank you. <laughs>